All righty. Well, all right, so I'm going to try out uh, the microphone uh, today mainly because uh, it seems like my voice isn't quite catching on the uh, video recordings. If this is uh, distracting to people, please let me know. I'll switch it up. Uh, all right, so uh, today we're going to take a little bit of a step back and uh, recap a couple of things. Um, today's lecture actually consists of two separate parts. Um, and the first part, I'd like to go over some uh, something that we've already covered, but uh, I'd like to kind of uh, shore it up in your minds a little bit. Um, so we're going to talk, we're going to go back to cost estimation. We're going to talk about how, uh, how you estimate costs and how this kind of fits into the big picture of I can just uh, sit here while you finish your conversations. So, uh, once again, if you have not turned in your homeworks yet, please turn them in quietly. And, um, like I said, I'd like to take a couple of steps back and shore up in your minds uh, how exactly uh, cost estimation works and where it fits into the grand scheme of things. Uh, so, let me start off by kind of giving you the big picture of a, a SQL processing system. Uh, the, the SQL query kind of comes in uh, gets parsed in into, uh, as I'm sure you're familiar by now, a uh, relational algebra expression. Uh, but that expression that gets parsed in is typically not the expression that actually gets evaluated. Um, practically every single major database system out there uh, is going to have an optimizer component that takes in a set of statistics uh, that uh, it has previously gathered about the database and applies that plus a couple of uh, rules of thumb or uh, heuristics uh, that kind of tr take the original plan and uh, transform it into something that is hopefully much more efficient. And that more efficient thing is what actually gets executed. Um, now, kind of how this fits into your projects, the uh, checkpoint one was essentially the entire execution platform without that optimizer component. Uh, and as you, I'm sure you've noticed by now, um, you need to do some level of optimization uh, for uh, checkpoint two. Um, this is essentially the rules of thumb at parts of the optimizer, uh, where uh, there's a couple of heuristics that just always make sense, a couple of uh, transformations that just always make sense. Uh, checkpoint three is going to have you bringing in some of those st statistics as well as uh, using indexing strategies and so forth. Um, any questions on this so far? Great. So how does this optimizer look like? Well, um, we went over relational algebra uh, equivalencies and most of the uh, the job that an optimizer performs uh, is built around these equivalencies. Um, so typically the input uh, to this optimizer is a standard relational algebra plan, and the output is going to be something a little more complex. It's going to be, uh, you might think of a sort of extended form of relational algebra uh, that includes uh, such annotations as uh, perform this join as a sort merge, perform this join as uh, as a uh, hybrid hash joint, that kind of thing. Um, and, yeah. So uh, the optimizer is basically going to take this, this input, this unannotated plan, and it's going to assign these annotations, and it's going to reorder the plan 
uh, in such a way that it makes it more efficient. Uh, to give you a bit of an example here, uh, we have a query taken from the TPCH schema. Uh, that? And uh, there's a number of different ways of evaluating that query. So um, are there, first off, are these two uh, binary, uh, sorry, these two relational algebra trees equivalent? Yes. Um, and can you prove that they are equivalent? Well, uh, how, let me rephrase it, how would you prove that they are equivalent? So selection commutes with selection commutes with the okay. So I can take the price, uh, the price select, the selection on price, with uh, and commute it with the join. Under what conditions, by the way, is that the case? Okay. So the. Uh, the uh, selection commutes with join as long as uh, the selection predicate only applies to one of the two sides. So we can essentially push the selection down, and that ends up reducing the number of orders that we need to, uh, to, to process in that join query. So when doing these kinds of optimizations, what kind of things do we need to take into account? kind of uh, features of the data set. All right, shout outs, any features, it uh, really doesn't matter. Uh, what kind of, just, what are some uh, features of, of uh, a relation that might be an Sorry? Whether there's an index, great. I'm actually not gonna write these down because I've got them on the next slide. But one, whether there's an index. What else? What about the relation itself? Uh, what kind of statistics can we gather about the relation? The size. Great, there's another one. What if it's uh, stored on disk? What else might we care about? I heard something that sounded vaguely correct. And Okay, so if it's sorted or not, that's another interesting feature. Uh, so the physical layout, um, things like uh, sort order, uh, things like uh, oh, oh, uh, what it is sorted on, uh, whether it's indexed, whether it's sorted in a clustered index, or whether there are secondary unclustered indexes built over it. Okay. Um, what about individual uh, attributes? What can we? Uh, what information can we gather about those? Okay, so we can uh, gather various statistics about the values that are present uh, in that particular attribute, things like uh, the upper bound, lower bound, uh, or possibly a histogram over those values. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, relevant factors that come into play. Um, things, let's see, what wasn't mentioned? Uh, so the size, the number of bytes that a given tuple consumes, um, the uh, the number of tuples that'll typically fit into a block and kind of go back and forth between this and the total number of blocks. Um, things like the number of distinct values um, or potentially equivalently a histogram. Um, sel uh, properties like selectivity, which we typically have to compute uh, from a histogram or some sort of distribution. Um, and things like uh, indexes and various statistics about those indexes. So uh, when we actually try and sit down and compute the cost of uh, one of these, uh, of a particular operation, um, ultimately we're not actually gonna be able to predict the cost. Um, what we have to work with uh, are, various, are various statistics 
uh, about the data, and all we can really do is compute an um, compute an approximation of the runtime. Uh, so, given the, given these statistics, we can kind of come up with a number of different heuristics or uh, uh, a number of different rules of thumb for estimating uh, the relative cost of different uh, algorithms. So, we're going to uh, just as a piece of notation, uh, given a particular algorithm, um, we're going to call that the cost of that algorithm. Um, also note that there's a number of different metrics that we can use. Um, the I.O. cost is one specific metric, but uh, you could also measure it in terms of a uh, number of tuples processed, uh, CPU time, um, or well, those are the, the big ones. So keep that in mind. So let's have a look at a quick example. Um, font size bigger in these. Uh, so let's say we have a selection predicate, simple equality test over um, a given attribute. Um, now, how would we perform that selection? Let's say that that selection was sitting directly over a uh, relation. So we have selection of a relation. What are some ways that we could perform that particular operation or implement? Normal scan. Okay, so we could do a file scan. And um, there's a couple of different ways that we could do that file scan. Um, so let's say that we're doing a linear search of the data. How long is that going to take? Number of tuples, thank you. Or if we're, uh, so that's going to be uh, the cost in terms of uh, number of tuples. Uh, what about the cost in terms of number of blocks? Number of blocks in the file, or in the relation, yeah. Um, so the cost of this uh, primitive operation, uh, file scan, uh, sorry, li uh, linear search of the data is going to be, uh, in terms of IOs, the total number of blocks in the file. Uh, what, a, uh, what other kinds of ways could we do, uh, could, in what other kinds of ways uh, could we access data in a, just in a regular file? Okay, so it could be indexed or it could be sorted. Let's uh, handle sort first. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so, how would we use a sort? Binary search. And what kind of uh, cost is that going to uh, incur for us? Log n, great. Uh, it's actually going to be ceiling of log n, uh, just because you always have to round up. Um, right. And it, it's going to be log n, uh, but there's also going to be an extra term in there, uh, which it, the, the cost is going to be proportional to finding the first element, but there's also an extra cost. With that. What's that going to be? Overflow, well, there are, in just a sorted file, there's no overflow pages. Okay, so if there are multiple uh, tuples or multiple uh, records that have the same uh, search key, then you're going to have to return all of them. So you're not just, keep in mind that you're not just returning one value. You're not just uh, doing a binary search to find one value. You're actually doing a full scan. Um, right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, is there any way that we could predict that's not the case. We could predict that there's uh, the number of uh, values that we're going to get returned. Okay, so if you have a, uh, the unique keyword or uh, if that particular attribute is a primary key uh, in the schema, then you're guaranteed to return only a single value. Okay, what if we're doing an index scan? Um, What if we're doing an index scan uh, and A is a primary key? So uh, we have an index uh, that is the primary index, it's a clustered index, 
for um, the relation, and uh, A is a primary key. What would our cost be in that case? So let me, let me refine that a little bit. Let's say, uh, as it says up there, uh, we're dealing with a B plus tree. So how long, uh, what kind of cost would be associated with log, okay, so the depth of the tree, which is log uh, kn. Um, and then how much to actually read the data values for the, the tuples. Just one, yeah. So we have only, because it's a primary key, there's only one uh, one tuple that we have to return here. Um, okay. What if we're not dealing with a primary key? Okay, so we'd have to compute the number of tuples that we're returning. And we have a term for that uh, that we used earlier, um, the selectivity of the, uh, the attribute. Um, now, how, uh, how would we go about computing that selectivity? Okay, so if we have a distribution uh, over the data values, we could estimate that selectivity by figuring out what portion of the uh, or frequency uh, histogram uh, of uh, the data, uh, where the attributes live, we could use that histogram to figure out what fraction of the table uh, resides within the, the portion uh, that the selection predicate is testing for. Okay, um, now you'll note up there there's uh, a we're dividing by the number of pages. Why, uh, sorry, the number of records for pages uh, per page. Uh, um, so you note that there's a, uh, we're dividing by the number of, uh, by FR, which, uh, which is the number of records per page. Why, why would we do that? Okay, so we read the entire uh, uh, we read the entire page um, as we're scanning through it. Uh, why is it safe to do so? Why is it safe to assume that all of the records are going to be uh, relevant to excuse me to the uh, the query that we're asking? It's a cluster index, and what does that mean? that all of the leaf pages are in sorted order. So what if the index is not clustered or uh, it's non-primary? It's another way, of, an equivalent way of saying that. Okay, so the, uh, the outcome in that case would, inv uh, would be the same. The only difference is that you, because you can't be guaranteed that all of your returned data values are contiguous, you can't divide by um, the number of records per page. In the worst possible case, you have to uh, perform one access uh, per data value that you have to return. Okay, any questions on uh, cost estimation for simple index look? All right, great. So let's uh, let's keep moving. Um, cost estimation for external sort. So just to remind you, uh, external sort involves uh, two stages. Stage one, you're going to uh, read in m blocks at a time and sort those m blocks. Make sure that those m blocks are sorted. Then once those m blocks are, uh, once you have these uh, sorted, what are called runs, uh, you're going to take uh, a bunch of these and merge them together uh, using the standard uh, merge uh, 
using the standard merge sort algorithm. Um, to give you a little graphical demonstration of this, uh, you start off with this big block of unsorted data. Uh, then you, in this case, you have three blocks of memory uh, available. So you're going to uh, sort them into blocks of uh, three contiguous uh, sets. Uh, then you can take two at a time. You can merge these blocks together. Uh, so if you're merging two blocks at a time, how many stages would you need to uh, perform? Log base two of m. Uh, so, so yeah. Okay, so the total number of merge passes that we'll have to perform uh, is gonna be log uh, base, however many things you're merging together at a time. Uh, if you have m blocks of uh, available, or, sorry, m pages of available memory, then in the absolute worst case, you can still uh, merge m pages. You still have to reserve one uh, page, however, and what would that be for? Output. So you still need one page for your output. Okay, so for uh, building the initial runs, we have to do uh, perform two reads and writes. Uh, sorry, one read and one write. So we're gonna perform uh, one IO for every uh, page that we've uh, accessed. And we can, as a little bit of an optimization, uh, we can potentially avoid performing uh, the, the last write. Why, uh, why would you think that is? Why can we skip? Uh, as we're generating the, the last set of pages, uh, why is it, why do you think we might be able to skip the last uh, set of writes? Right, so the, the uh, to, refer, uh, to restate that, um, for the last step of the process, uh, you're essentially feeding data out to the next stage, whatever that is, and so you, uh, you're going to have to read it back into memory anyway, so you may as well just uh, read it out in one go. You may as, just, you may as well just pass it to the next stage um, without any sort of extra effort. Um, so the total amount of uh, trans block, yes? So the question is, if I understand you correctly, why uh, if you have the memory to sort everything, why? So the question, again, I'm not entirely certain I'm following your question. So my my claim here is that we uh, we need to write. So the first step, we need to read this off of disk and then write this back to disk. And then we do the same thing for these blocks, for these blocks, and for these blocks. So that's one round of read and then write. Read three blocks, sort them, write them. Um, now, for this merge process, I'm again going to have to read each of these blocks, write them, uh, and then write them out to disk. Okay, so your claim is that if I read all of the, um, 
instead of writing directly out to disk, uh, I could simply read the next batch of records in and then save myself the trouble of writing them back to disk. So the main benefits of external sort, or the main uh, reason that you would do uh, an external sort is if you don't have enough memory to keep everything in, uh, in memory at a given time. Uh, if I have enough memory to do everything, yes, read everything into memory, do a complete sort over everything in it, and uh, don't even bother writing any intermediate state out to disk. Um, the, the problem that occurs is when you can't fit everything in memory. So in this example, um, I can perform this entire sort with only three records worth of memory. I read three records in, and I sort just those records. So my working set size here is three. Right? those three records back up to this. Then, at that point, I can clear out my memory entirely, read another three records in, sort those, write those three records up, back to this. And when I'm performing this merge, what do I need in memory at any given time? You need one block of each. Remember, a block here is one record. So block, so I need, do I need the entire set of three orders and this entire set of three orders? Right, so I can read one tuple in, one tuple in, uh, one tuple from the upper set, one tuple from the lower set, and then whichever one uh, is smaller gets written to the output. Does, so, uh, the reason that I wouldn't just read another set of values in is that, at least in the case where this algorithm is useful, um, I don't have enough memory to do so. Does that address your concern? Yes. skip the right cost for the final phase simply because uh, the immediate next step is going to be to read all of those values uh, back out. Now keep in mind that this uh, still requires uh, m uh, all, one block of every single file that you're reading from, so this may not always be feasible. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to cover is join costs. And uh, to illustrate some of these, I'm going to use a couple of examples. Um, so in the following examples, I'll be using uh, two input tables, customer and depositor. And the customer relation is, has uh, 10,000 records 
uh, spread across, across 400 blocks, and the depositor relation has 5,000 records spread across 100 blocks. So nested loop join, by now I hope you guys know this algorithm inside and out. Uh, a couple of bits of terminology I may not have uh, used very extensively, um, but just to uh, emphasize it, tuples, uh, the outer relation is called, uh, is the relation on the outer loop, the inner relation is the relation on the inner loop. And this is a uh, rather extensive, uh, expensive operation. That said, the cost of this algorithm, uh, there are two different ways of costing it. Um, a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. So what is the best case, just the scenario, what is the scenario under which nested loop joint performs the best? Okay, so you could potentially get a benefit when joining if the both relations are sorted, but does that play any, fa any factor in nested to join? No. So, okay, so if the size is small, uh, the size of the data set is small, uh, can you be more specific? Uh, let's do this by hand, there's uh, some good discussion. Uh, what's up? Uh, what do you mean by left, inner, or outer? Okay, so if there's only one tuple in the outer relation, that uh, means nested loop uh, joint performs well. I, I won't argue with that, but I think that's a really uh, Really corner case scenario. Yes. Okay. So if the if both data sets are small enough that building a set of hashes will uh, be more expensive, that that is correct. Uh, could you tell me how? Could you give me a sense of what? small enough might mean. Okay, so both tables fit in memory. That's one, one suggestion, uh, one situation. Um, is it the case that I need both tables in memory? Only one table. Which table? The small, okay, so the smaller one would become which of the two relations? Inner or outer? Inner, okay. So if I have uh, enough space in memory to hold the entire inner relation, That'll improve things. Um, okay, so if I don't have enough memory to hold uh, the inner relation, uh, what is my cost going to be? So what do I need to do on each iteration of the nested loop chain? Each outer iteration. So I need to read the in entire inner table completely. Um, and I need to do that how many times? So that it's going to be equal to the number of tuples in the outer table. Okay, so my total cost here is going to be the number of tuples in the outer table times the cost of reading in the entire inner relation. Uh, and then I still have to read every tuple in the outer relation as well. On the other hand, in the case where everything fits in memory, or at least the inner relation fits in memory, uh, what does that get us? At least in terms of IO costs. Okay, so then I don't need to read, uh, I don't need to page any of the inner relation out. It stays in memory. I don't need to reread it back in, so I just need to read it exactly once. So nested loop drops down to uh, the sum of the cost of reading both relations. Um, 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 um. Oops. 
Ah, great. Example. Uh, so in a, uh, let's go back to our example. We have the customer and depositor relation, and we want to join them together. So if the depositor is our outer relation, and remember this is uh, going to uh, the outer, the depositor relation has uh, 5,000 tuples in it. Um, this means we're going to need to uh, perform uh, about 2 million, 2 million block transfers. 5,000 tuples in the outer relation, um, 400 blocks in the inner relation, and then uh, that ends up producing uh, 2 million IO operations. Uh, if we swap customer to be the outer relation, then uh, that drops down to about a million uh, block transfers because there are fewer blocks in the depositor relation. So typically, uh, what does it make sense to put in the inside of the... Uh, so you, your inner relation should always be your smaller relation. Um, and ideally then, if it fits entirely in memory, then your cost drops down even further. Uh, so obviously, this is not necessarily the best, most efficient use of your uh, I.O. resources. Uh, so it's block nested loop join. Um, so, right. Uh, so essentially, block nested loop join it's the same thing as nested loop join. You're just reading, um, you're just kind of paging uh, data in um, a little bit more intelligently. So in this case, the uh, you can kind of reduce the multiplicative factor around the uh, nested loop join um, rather than being the number of uh, tuples of the outer relation. Then you have to, <coughs> you, uh, reduce it to be the number of blocks of the outer relation. Uh, reduce the cost. Right. OK. Um, next thing on the list, uh, index. Oh, actually, let's uh, go back to that. Um, so in our example, uh, recall, So recall that uh, we had 5,000 operate. There we go. Uh, recall that we had 10,000 operations in uh, the records, rela uh, records relation. Um, so what would the cost under block nested loop join be here? The, the most efficient cost in terms of block nested loop join be here? Five hundred. So five hundred blocks of what? So let's say we can read one block at a time. How are you getting f uh, 500,000? Oh, uh, just 500. Um, where are you getting 500? So, yes, with a block nested loop join, uh, assuming you do not have, uh, what is the cost of block nested loop join, assuming you do not have enough memory to hold the entire uh, depositor or customer relation. Oh, come on, this is... All right, how do we compute this? What's the formula? Okay, so 40,100. How are you getting that? Okay, so I have to read 
uh, assuming that I use depositor as my outer relation, sorry, as my, yes, outer relation, wait, no, assuming I use depositor as my inner relate, inner relation, then um, I need to read uh, the customer relation once, and I need to read uh, the depositor relation, uh, yeah, I need to read the depositor relation um, 400 times. So that's going to produce 40,000 operations. And then I need to read the entire customer relation once. That's going to be another 100, uh, sorry, another 400 operations. So in the case of block nested loop join, you're actually better off moving the uh, larger relation to the outside. All right. Moving on. All right. Uh, index nested loop join. So, for an index nested loop join, uh, when are we allowed to perform an index nested loop join? Okay, so if I have uh, an index on the join, the join attribute, uh, if I have an index on the join attribute, um, and what is that index built over? So can I do this on any join, anywhere, any plan? No. So there are only certain uh, even plan structures where I can uh, on which I can perform uh, an index nested loop join. So what's the requirement? Uh, one of them was, was you mentioned, um, which is that there's an index built on the join attribute. What else do I need? Let's say I have be built over one uh, an attribute that is uh, uh, that is part of the join. Right. Um, so the the basic algorithm has been mentioned numerous times. Uh, if for every tuple in the outer, this is basically an index nested loop join, but instead of scanning over the entire uh, inner relation, you do an index lookup for tuples that could potentially match on the inner relation. Um, so if we have uh, only enough space for uh, one page of each relation, sort of the worst case scenario, uh, but also probably the easiest to compute, uh, what would our cost be? So let's start by uh, the cost of one lookup. So what would um, what would what would I need to do? I'm scanning over the 
attribute, sorry, the, the tuples of R. R is my outer relation here. Uh, that means I need to, at the very least, read in every tuple of R. That's one, uh, one set of values. For every tuple of R, what else, what, what do I then do? You do an index lookup on S. And what does that mean? Okay, so most of you answered this question correctly on the midterm. Okay, it depends on the index. Uh, so we're going to use a uh, contact, uh, a, a attribute here. Um, we're we're going to abstract this out. Um, if we're dealing with a uh, hash, if we're dealing with a B plus tree, what is that cost going to be? Log of fan out uh, times the size of the relation. Great. Okay, so, uh, right. So when computing that C, the main, the main thing of importance is what kind of index you're using. Uh, for hash index, by the way, how many, uh, what are, uh, what would the cost be? Constant time uh, and in size of the smaller table, but here we're doing an index lookup over only one table. So if we're doing, uh, sorry, not a hash join. Um, if we're doing a uh, index nested loop join over a hash table, or sorry, hash index. The, the hash index is not in memory and you need to read the entire index in? No. Um, so what's, uh, now one question you should be asking me is what type of hash index? Um, so let's say uh, we're dealing with an extendable hash index. I'm seeing two, why would you say two? Okay, so there's a directory page I need to access, and there's the actual hash buckets themselves. Great. All right, uh, so kind of to summarize here, um, optimization kind of, the, the optimization essentially involves uh, estimating the cost of a full set of different types of plants. Uh, different join orders, different um, um, different uh, indexing strategies, and different access paths. But in general, there's a handful of rules of thumb that always going to make sense. Uh, selection always eliminates tuples. The, the earlier you do it, the better. Um, join plenty of join algorithms that are much more uh, efficient than Cartesian product or nested loop join. Perform them when possible. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, projecting out attributes can save you a bit of effort as well. Not always, but um, often. Right. Um, So uh, to, to kind of put this in the context of uh, your project, the, or specifically checkpoint two, um, what you're probably going to want to um, build into your plans if you haven't already done so, is some sort of notion of uh, not just which operators uh, occur where in your plan, but how those operators might be implemented. And uh, this is typically done by means uh, little annotations uh, or sort of extended forms, uh, an extended form of relational algebra. So for example, here this join is uh, annotated as being a block nested loop join. Uh, the selection predicate 
uh, is annotated as, be, as being performed over a full table scan rather than an index. And there's some uh, references. Uh, you don't necessarily need to copy these down. Uh, the slides are online. Um, there's some references that uh, are available if you're uh, still unsure about uh, things with, uh, with respect to cost estimation. Uh, so with that, let me say let's take a quick uh, five-minute break and come back at about 5.57. All right, so we don't actually have uh, enough time for me to uh, do too much on this, uh, but let, let's see how far we can get. Um, so on last Monday, we talked about uh, transactions, and we started talking about how uh, correctness was not only uh, important uh, from the perspective of uh, data just coming in and uh, the, the sort of schema of uh, the data, but also with respect to uh, the order in which uh, operations were applied. In a, in a typical database setting, uh, we have multiple users trying to use the database at the same time. So uh, we kind of want to make sure that as those users are interacting with the database, that their operations get uh, performed correctly. So. Um, just to recap what we discussed on, uh, a little more recap of what we discussed on Monday, uh, a couple of definitions. So um, when, I'm gonna, when I use the term value uh, or object, I'm referring to pretty much anything that lives within a database, uh, a row, a cell, a column, a whole bunch of different things fall under the category of object uh, in a data, or value in a database. Um, now, a, tip, uh, a typical database uh, reduces all of the, the interactions with the data that it manages down to uh, kind of the simplest representation, uh, a read or write to a value. And we're going to call that a primitive operation. And in order to uh, talk about uh, concurrency, we're going to assume that even in the case of a, a sequence of concurrent operations, uh, each of these objects is going to be accessed in some meaningful order. And that we can take the order in which these objects are accessed, and even though they're being accessed, in, in, uh, accessed concurrently, we can still kind of place them into some sort of order or schedule. So that kind of brought us to this question of what does a correct schedule mean? Um, so what is a correct schedule? Or what kind of assumptions can we make about a schedule? What do we need to know at the very least? OK, so some sort of equivalence. Um, so we need, uh, we would like to know whether, whether this, uh, we'd like to have some sort of definition for uh, equivalence with respect to correctness. And if we're talking about um, equivalence, uh, the use of equivalence, that means that there's some sort of equivalence class of queries that are uh, correct. So. If we're defining an equivalence class, uh, we need some sort of baseline, um, some, something that we can uh, completely and unambiguously say, this is a correct schedule. So how might we go about defining uh, that sort of baseline? A set of possible copies. OK, so we could talk about the results. Um, but um, if we're talking about, so how would we take a look at a schedule and say, this is a correct schedule? Just uh, the outcome of a schedule, yeah. OK, 
so we could use as a pure baseline uh, this idea of um, we could segment each of the uh, sort of more complex operations. Uh, I believe you used the word process. Um, I'm going to use the word transaction. Um, we could take uh, sort of these more complex processes, uh, transactions, and we could say uh, transaction one executes first, transaction two executes second, and that is that is a correct schedule. Now I'm going to generalize that. Or vice versa. Yeah, so transaction one executes entire executes first, then transaction two, or transaction two executes first, and then transaction one. Now, uh, a question was brought up on Monday. Um, why do we ignore order? Well, uh, basically we ignore order because uh, that's the more general case. Uh, but if we're going to define an equivalence class uh, using some set of correct schedules as a baseline, uh, there's no reason that uh, we have to uh, use the more general notion. In fact, uh, we could simply take this more, we could just pick some set of schedules that are correct and just use them as a baseline. And in term, uh, just because it's, uh, it's the most general thing that we can think of, uh, we're going to use this idea of a transaction as the minimal unit of atomicity. Uh, so one transaction uh, is guaranteed to be atomic, but it's not guaranteed to be uh, in any order with respect to any other transaction. So transaction one could execute first, then transaction two executes, or transaction two could execute first, and then transaction one executes. And both of those, from our perspective as the database, uh, are guaranteed to be correct. Um, additionally, that's uh, OK, because if we wanted to enforce that one set of operations came before another set of operations, we could also simply say uh, that those two sets of operations were part of the same <laughs> transaction. Um, that way we could kind of, because these transactions can grow as large as you want, uh, we can kind of enforce that those transactions all get executed as one coherent chunk. Yes? Uh, so the question is, can a transaction be uh, programmed to execute in a FIFO order? Yes, so typically, um, I can also amend what I said before uh, by saying that we can insert a marker in the transaction, uh, typically referred to as a commit, uh, which marks the end of a transaction. And as soon as uh, the transaction is declared to be committed, that means that its effects have been persisted and are globally visible. So any transactions that ap uh, appear after the commit point are guaranteed to kind of come after that uh, first transaction. Um, this kind of defers, uh, defers ordering to something outside of the database, but that's typically where you want it to live anyway. So that's often okay. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? All right, cool. Um, right. So we, on Monday, I introduced the term serial uh, as a serial schedule, and that's basically what we just discussed. Transaction one occurs first, transaction two occurs second, or transaction two occurs second, transaction one occurs, sorry, transaction two occurs first, transaction one occurs second. Uh, in either case, uh, the transaction is kind of the, the minimal unit of atomicity. And that's what we call uh, any, any schedule. Uh, remember, a, s a schedule is a, a sequence of individual read or write operations. So any schedule that uh, enforces that property, uh, that the transactions are kind of clumped together and, and not interleaved, uh, is a serial schedule. And so we can uh, define uh, correctness by means of, of a sort of equivalence class. And for an equivalence class, we need to define some notion of equivalence. Uh, so one way to look at this is in terms of the output. Uh, if two different schedules produce the same output, then they are 
uh, equivalent. And we can say that a schedule is serializable if it is equivalent, or at least guaranteed to be equivalent, to uh, a schedule that we know is serial. So we can do any kind of rewriting that we want as long as it doesn't break uh, the output. Now, there is some uh, hand-waving going on here. Uh, the, there's some hand-waving going on here because if we're going to be talking about schedules in terms of outputs, well, we actually have to, how do we get that output? Typically, we're going to, if we're trying to determine equivalence based on outputs, we're going to actually have to run the schedule in, in its entirety. Um, you can determine equivalence in a couple of other ways, but there, I mean, essentially what we're trying to do here is, uh, well, maybe not quite solve the halting problem, but this is, this is, comparing outputs is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so this is not something that we really want to be testing for uh, before we run a query. We want to actually make sure that uh, a serial, uh, sorry, a schedule is uh, serializable, but at the same time, we don't necessarily want to uh, go through all of the overhead of detecting serializability. So what people have come up with are a couple of simplifications, uh, relaxations of this property that uh, get kind of the same effect, but are much easier to detect up front. So one idea that people had is something known as conflict equivalence. What conflict equivalence is, uh, it's based on this idea that let's take a look at the reads and the writes that the transaction performs. And if the reads and writes kind of uh, match up, then we can uh, treat, the, uh, sorry, the reads and the writes of two different schedules match up, then we can kind of look at those as uh, equivalent. So let me be a little more precise about what I mean there. Um, if we went over last Monday this idea of uh, read and write conflicts. So you can have uh, a read-write conflict, a write-read conflict, or a write-write conflict. Um, if you try and write to the same value, if you try and read to, from the same value, uh, that's that is one transaction effectively interacting with another transaction. And the idea of conflict equivalence is that if transaction one interacts with transaction two in a particular way, or uh, transaction one performs a write, then transaction two reads the effects of that write, that is a conflict or, or an interaction between those two transactions. Um, and the idea of conflict equivalence is that two schedules are conflict equivalent if all of those interactions are in the same order. And I thought I had an example slide for this. So instead, um, transaction one, transaction two. So transaction one, uh, you'll see this kind of format uh, pop up a number of different times. Uh, I have two different transactions, and time flows downwards. So transaction starts by writing to value A, transaction two then reads that value of A. Now I have an interaction, be now I have an interaction between these two uh, operations uh, where transaction one interacts, uh, transaction one's interaction with that object precedes transaction twos. Now, excuse me. Um,
Now I have another schedule. This is a schedule that contains exactly the same set of operations, but in this schedule, transaction two, transaction two performs its interaction first. So the idea of conflict, uh, these two schedules would not be conflict equivalent because the order in which the interactions happen, uh, the order, uh, the dependence graph of these conflicts is different. And so the idea of conflict equivalence is that I have some serial schedule that uh, the schedule, uh, sorry, a schedule is conflict serializable if there is a serializable schedule under which um, the two are conflict equivalent, to which uh, the two are conflict equivalent. Now, So now I have another, I just added another operation here, uh, which right, uh, tra in which transaction two writes to B, transaction one reads from B. I have two different conflicts here. This conflict, the ordering uh, is that transaction one came first. This conflict, the ordering is that transaction two came first. Now, uh, the idea of so conflict equivalence basically says that I can uh, reorder the operations in any way I see fit as long as uh, their relative uh, order within the overall schedule stays the same. So I could potentially. Uh, so here are some quick questions for you. Are these two schedules conflict equivalent? Yes. Why? They occur in the same order. So I swapped the order of these two operations, but the specific conflicts still occur uh, in the same order relative uh, to one another. Now, is this, is this schedule conflict serializable? So can I do that kind of uh, reordering to make it so that all of these, uh, the operations in one transaction occur immediately next to one another? Okay, how would I do that? Write to A after the read, uh, say again? After read of B. So I could swap these two. So if I understand you correctly, what you're suggesting uh, is is these two conflict, uh, is this schedule a conflict equivalent to this schedule? Yes. So this conflict, same order. This conflict, same order. Is this schedule serial? No. Why? 
Well, uh, uh, it's not conflict equivalent to a serial schedule, but is it a serial schedule itself? Why, uh, I, I'm hearing yeses. Uh, what is the... Sorry, I'm overloading you guys with terms here. Uh, there are two distinct terms. So there's serializable, and there is serial. What is a serial schedule? There's no interleavings. Is this a serial schedule? No. Why? Because those two occur on either side. So um, is the schedule itself serializable? Yes. So how would I, uh, I'm hearing yeses. How would I implement that? OK, so if I did one of these transactions first, uh, which one should I do first? Transaction two, OK. Read A, write B, and then write A, read B. All right, well, I've got some conflicts here. I've got another conflict here. Is that conflict equivalent? No. OK, maybe you try the other one. Let's do T1 first. Right of A, read of B, read of A, right of B. All right, well, got some more conflicts here. Is this conflict equivalent? No. Is it conflict serializable? No. Um, I'm missing the other two orders here, hand waving them away. But yes, the, uh, these two are not conflict serializable. Uh, so, if it, uh, uh, so this is not a conflict serializable schedule. Um, all right, it's 6.20, so uh, we'll get into view serializability on Wednesday. But something to consider over the next uh, day or two. Um, why is this too strong? <laughs>